So Michelle, why did you come to Chico in the first place? What brought you here? I came to take my first job on finishing my PhD at Tulane in New Orleans. And I had no idea where it was. I was told there was a big, big prison here. Oh. <laughs> And then eventually I got here and acclimated. I, it occurred to me suddenly, if there's a big prison here, where is it? I should know, see it somewhere. And of course that was Chino. So that shows the level of ignorance away from California about the West Coast. I, I came to Chico, I had never heard of it, and I, I came from grad school at Santa Barbara. I see? had no idea. Yeah, well, to Southern California, Northern California, is out of their thoughts altogether. <laughs> it's a whole other world up here, and sometimes now I agree. <laughs> but in any case, I came here to take a position in political science, and I wasn't particularly interested in history per se, but my husband and I bought an old house, uh, this old house, and the reason it appealed to me was that it was a farmhouse, clearly, it looked like Midwestern farmhouses. And I came from Iowa, so I thought that would be a nice thing to have on the side in my life. You know, I could talk about Plato and Locke at school, and then I could come home and read up on interior design or whatever, just for a, a break, you know. And um, that turned into a huge project, but. Um, Along the way, I found out from the person I bought the house from that it had been owned by A. H. Chapman. And this area of town where the house is was uh, called, is called Chapman Town. So I would be asked who he was, and I had no idea. When and did you buy the house? This was in 1976. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm a trained researcher. I'll just you know, jump over to special collections and they can show me a few things and then I'll at least say what he, you know, he was a criminal or he was, you know, what was he? Uh, and another lo a local historian in town named John Noble heard I was interested in this. And he had been collecting historical data for years. So I didn't know him, but he called and offered to bring over Chapman's obituary. And that's a great place to start, you know. Um, and it was remarkable. It was um, long. It was ad very admiring him for his contributions of many kinds. And it said that he had led the um, uh, culmination of the uh, town response, forming a vigilante group in the period of the anti-Chinese violence. He was a leader of the vigilante group? Yes, mm. and this was a different kind of vigilante group. The problem was that the town uh, officials were so overwhelmed by anti-Chinese, they were afraid of the anti-Chinese. So the anti-Chinese who were burning up buildings, killing people, were not being investigated. They were not being sought out. They certainly were not being prosecuted. This sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of January 6th. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. And so um, Chapman, who was a businessman in town, did something very courageous. I mean, he owned a whole block that was a lumber yard and he was building a fabulous house across the street, lumber, uh, frame lumber. So he would have been, become a target of these guys. But he very quickly brought together all the, it was like 150 men in the business community, and they decided to act as if they were a government. Wow. And they hired detectives, and the Chinese hired detectives. And they very quickly rounded up the people who were responsible. When was Plus, this, what, roughly? Uh, this was in 1877. And the Chinese were brought here as laborers to build the rock walls? They were here, they were brought 
to California and the West Coast to build railroads. Ah. And then eventually the railroad, railroad work died out as the tracks were down. And so more and more of them began funneling into small towns because they were familiar and very competent agricultural workers from their life in China. They quickly took up a, a made up a solution to local farmers. Local farmers um, and businessmen were aggravated because former gold miners now were looking for work. But there weren't enough of them willing to do this work uh, at a low wage. And the businessmen and the farmers felt they had to pay a low wage because they didn't make much themselves. Um, with the Chinese, the Chinese came in and they would work for under a dollar a day. Wow. And white men worked for a dollar a day, so this is kind of rough. <clears throat> so they came up in numbers and they were very capable and very cooperative. They didn't talk back or move, just pick up and take off. They could be relied on. So they made a growing part of the workforce. And then that cut off work for younger men who are not yet skilled. You know, so you can see you can see both sides of this. Or at least that's kind of my specialty is to understand in these things in history that I that I work on. I am interested in what happened, but I've always been more interested in why it happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm not much of one who says that I'm not a very black and white person. I'm not one who says the whites were evil and the Indians were good, or the Chinese were evil and the whites were bad. You know, you kind of have to really look at what happened and see it as a human situation. Mm. And in that sense, I, ha I bring a kind of a modern perspective to it. That's kind of what we aspire to do, I, at least at, at an academic level. And those Chinese were mostly men, and women were prohibited in the Chinese Exclusion Act from coming in because they didn't want them to have babies? That was in the 1880s, yeah. Um, there, there were very few Chinese women, is absolutely the case. And um, it was uh, an effort, as you said, to just drive them out of the entire workforce. Some women kept coming through because they were brought in. Men wanted to reestablish their families, and uh, some managed to do that. Uh, at least two Chico families were able to do that. Hmm. And they lived uh, quietly, very, um, very uh, uh, stringent economies, but they helped one another, so they pooled their resources. So they could live here and then send money home. The whites uh, in the community tried to drive them out by just telling them to get out of here. But they, you know, they wouldn't go. They didn't have really anything, so they couldn't go much, go far. And so um, a coterie of whites in 18, late 1876 began to uh, decide, well, they won't take threats. They won't take, you know, being insulted all the time. Um, if we punish them with violence, it might be fear that would lead them to go. Some of them would be hurt, the others would not want to, and they'll leave. So a group of men formed a, um, a, a group a, uh, an attack group, a violence group. They were supposedly secret. But you know, this was a town of like 3,000 people. <laughs> so rumors were everywhere. So people in their minds kind of knew what was going on, but didn't talk about it too openly. Um, and the group uh, began, or continued, uh, setting fire to Chinese housing. Um, they began uh, shooting at Chinese, sometimes killing them, sometimes not. Um, 
most of the time not, but enough that it was a scary situation, of course. Um, so um, this group did put together a um, an action force that one night in late 1876 uh, walked out as the sun was setting down Humboldt Road to a farm where they um, knew there was a camp of Chinese who had been hired to clear brush for the farmer. And they had a small camp where they lived, sort of a shack they built to uh, cover them. And there were six of them in that shack. And there were six men, actually, who came out. Somebody knew the shack was theirs, and maybe that's why they knew the numbers. Six of them, six of us. Ah. Um, and they confronted the men in the shack, and each one shot a Chinese. And four died as they left, as the other men left. They were assuming that all six had been shot and would die. One of them was very seriously wounded. The other was somewhat wounded but pretended to die. And he, after they had clearly gone away, he went to the farm, he crossed the creek to the farmer. And the farmer was terrified, so wouldn't let them come in. He wouldn't go for help. He did let this guy come in, and the wife tore up a sheet to wrap his wound. And, uh, but he had to walk to town, to Chinatown, to get help. And there was a wonderful white character in Chinatown named Ben True. <laughs> Two of the, of the killers by the name were actually named Slaughter. Oh, gosh. And, and the policeman, who was their great confidant and backer in Chico, was Ben True, who was very tall, a fabulous singer at the Presbyterian Church. And he respected the Chinese so much that he learned a lot of their language. He learned their games. Like mahjong. Because, yeah, <laughs> because at lunch they played their games. And so he would give them tips on what to do. And if they had any problem with employers, they'd go to him and he would try to work it out. And he was kind of a labor contractor too then because people wanted help, they'd go to him and he'd connect them with the right Chinese. So Ben True went out to find the, find out what had happened. And he found, you know, the bodies and the one that was dying still. And from there, um, that's, that's when the crisis became known. It was just still as people watched these wagons come in with the corpses to Fetters and Williams of Furniture Store, which made caskets in the basement. That was one of their businesses. In any case, then Chapman organized them, but there was no investigation, nothing. Totally ignored. That's when Chapman then organized this business response. And it brought people. It was interesting. I found that there were so many distant owners of Chico area that these men from San Francisco and Sacramento came up, packed the hotels. They wanted to see what was going on in here because this was their money up here. So I thought that was an interesting uh, bit of understanding of what was happening. So um, 21 were arrested. They were held in the jail downtown of 3rd and Main. And the local militia, which was sort of a holdover from the Civil War, by this time it was a sort of Tony men's club. Um, they were brought around to protect the pri to surround the prison. They weren't trying to keep those guys in the prison. They were trying to keep the townspeople from springing them. <laughs> because this was the sons, you know, and these were t um, uh, all occupations. In modern Providence, it was, has been understood that they were outsiders who had brought in trouble. But these were down, these were just normal people from all parts of the economy. Um, they were middle class, there were some professionals. Um, 
So it, it engaged the whole community. Uh, well, one of the things that then was most interesting to me was that I began to realize that, you know, this is fascinating. Why don't people know this, you know? Why do they think, why do they have a totally different view of what happened? Because frankly, I didn't have to work that hard to find this information. Um, it was all on record of various kinds. So, um, it just, uh, that drew me away from, well, a third Chapman was there, but it also drew me into a, a different view of, of history as we've been knowing it. And part of the problem in that regard is that local history is not highly regarded in Academia. history, <laughs> academic history. It's considered something you leave to the local people and they can play around with it. It's They're historical care. societies or something. Yeah, exactly, or just um, local yokels, <laughs> as they tend to see us, I guess. Um, and I, it, made, it gave me a lot of respect, actually, for that, as a, for local history as a subject. Because it demonstrates, for one thing, that the country, it wasn't just Washington that's complicated. You know, um, people are, comp are, com are complicated at every level. And so in this town there were, there were heroes, there were people who loathed the heroes, <laughs> you know, there were just uh, mudsills, I mean, people who just worked their life through and everybody depended on, but never raised their voice to anything. There were people who tried to, you know, upgrade the community intellectually or culturally. There were people who did everything they could do to oppose that. Um, for example, local people, there was a local private high school run by a woman um, and her husband, but mostly by the woman. And she was very, she was very stringent and correct, and had very highly focused academically. I mean, the graduates of her school went to uh, Princeton, they went to Harvard, they went to major the military academy. When was so this? They were really. This was between about 1872 and 1895. Did they accept girls as well as boys? Oh yes. And the girls went on to those kind of universities. Yeah, Mary Chapman, from this family, all the Chapman children went there. And she went to uh, Mount Holyoke on the East Coast. She was the sole student from the West Coast. Wow. So um, the parents loved it. The children thrived in it. But it was a privileged education. Most, all other children, graduated at sixth grade. Really? There weren't any high, public high schools? Public uh, high school was considered a privilege, wow. reserved for the privilege, for the few. Did you have to pay? Oh, yeah, to go to this high, to their No, school. to public high school. Oh, no, public you did not have to pay. But there was a public high school in the 1870s? There was never a, a public high school for, uh, you know, as we would think of it, until the late 90s. So, uh -huh. so the general public then, I mean, many, not all, but many vocal people in the general public were irritated by this split, you know, that they were the lesser. Um, and so they uh, were very critical of the, of, of the Woods uh, couple. And uh, so there were a lot of, what I'm seeing, what I found, was that there were a lot of class divisions. There were clearly class divisions. This also, I felt I had a kind of access to this as well, because I grew up in Iowa. I grew up in a city of about 120,000 people, Cedar Rapids. But my family was anchored in a town, Monticello, which is 40 miles away which was a farm town, and we had a very large farm right at its edge. 
so uh, that was supposed to, we were supposed to relate to that. And so growing up, I definitely saw class divisions. I knew that we were kind of at the top of that in my family, but we were never supposed to, we never said it, you know. But we knew that people, some people were jealous of us or envious, quick to criticize. So we could never have, you know, we could never have a really fabulous car. We had to have a, a car like doctors had to have, like an Oldsmobile or a Chrysler. <laughs> you know, something like that. Not a Cadillac. <laughs> no, that's right. That was the, the days. And my mother wanted a Cadillac <laughs> in the city. So she got her own for herself, but her orders were never to take it to the farm. <laughs> so you know, anyway, this is, so I learned that, and it helped me recognize that there are complicated lives in those towns, and that you can learn a lot about human life if you look at it in the microcosm. Well, yeah, brilliant. You know, it, what I'm thinking about is this is so pertinent because because of the backlash against Asian Americans yeah. because of the COVID Chinese crazy Trump rhetoric that people are pushing for Asian American courses to be included in curriculum and it's happening around the country. So the story that you just told would would be really yeah. interesting to those kind of courses. Um, I want to make sure we talk about oh, sure. what um, Hutchinson, the kind of well-known history professor, William Hutchinson said were the most significant Chico but events. You notice he didn't, he didn't mention the Chinese. Right. Did he? No, he didn't. No. So let, let's go through those. I added a couple, and okay, I want to sure. see you at, what you would add. He said, okay, Chico history. The most important thing is John Bidwell Definitely. founded the city in 1850. Definitely. He, Bidwell is a fascinating character. And one of the reasons I didn't get interested in a local history for, until I bought this house was that it just didn't seem real. I mean, what American town has like one figure that is all that em embraces its whole history, and no one else is recognized or remembered, or you know, nothing carried forward from anybody else. And so it just seemed a little bit, well, just dull. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that so I didn't pay much attention to it. But then when I found Chapman. And even just by looking at his obituary, I could see this as a remarkable person. And mm -hmm. he should be remembered if that was a big right. deal. Right, right. But it's true. I think still in school, they just learn about Annie and John Bidwell. They don't it's learn about true. Chapman. Yeah. It's still true. Um, and then he came here to sell to gold miners, but he came to California because of the gold rush? Chapman. Bidwell. Oh, Bidwell, yeah. Um, he came here before the gold rush into California. Why? He came because, uh, well, he had started as a teacher. Oh. Then he worked as a, as a uh, then he wanted to have a farm of his own and um, set up a farm in Missouri, but he lost that. And at that time, people were gathering there to take off in parties going west. So he was a single young man. And it sounded really exciting and a whole new world and Mexico, you know, it was in a state at the time. And uh, so he came out and he went to work for John Sutter. And I think a lot, an important thing he learned from John Sutter was that Indians were capable of doing really good farm work and other jobs with training and the right attitude of working with them. And so he had, had he gathered a lot of um, knowledge from Sutter about this and um, then while out on an expedition for uh, Sutter, I can't recall whether it was Sutter that was lost some horse or something, but he came on this area and he just thought it was a beautiful area. Uh, before the fires it was. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, and so he arranged to uh, buy it, to acquire it, with 
money that once the gold rush came, he then had the money to buy it. And um, so that's how he came. And he started it where the mansion is. That was the headquarters. And around his headquarters, a community built up across the creek. Nothing here happened south of Big Chico Creek until 1860 because another farmer named Potter owned it. And while Bidwell wanted to acquire it, Potter didn't want to sell it. So Bidwell had to bide his time and this community uh, was Rancho Chico, but as people came in to get their goods and to socialize, it began just to be called, it was, for, it was known as Rio Chico. Then his place became known as, um, I believe something else. But, um, oh, and eventually people just said Chico, we're going to Chico. Well, Chico, his farm, his farm headquarters became Chico. And he did not like that. He didn't want to live in town. He didn't want it on his doorstep. Hmm. And yet he needed to have a place to keep goods and sell them and have his employees had to have a decent living situation. So when Potter died, his family wouldn't sell it either. <laughs> for, for almost, well, eight or nine years, um, he had to deal with these um, heirs. And the heirs wanted more and more for this land. And they knew he wanted to buy it. <laughs> so they had, they were at loggerheads. But eventually, um, the heirs gave up, and in 1860 he acquired it. And what he did, I think, is so remarkable. And I'm just kind of in awe of this, but I have a different frame of life on the world. Um, a, a different way of seeing these things. He literally took that farm next across the creek where downtown is today and he redesigned it all you know into streets and then he literally moved his people and the businesses off his ranch over to Chico Village so there was Chico Ranch, Rancho Chico, and this was Chico Village. And that's where downtown is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people would move a whole town just to have an open front yard? Yeah, I read he, he hired surveyors to lay out the street. Yeah, and they're very perfect streets. And um, he tore down the house he had been living in. This is another thing. People, cannot, people have a hard time thinking that he had a really good house before this one. They want to think he was in a log cabin <laughs> while everybody else was living in houses. That's not John Bidwell. In those days you had to have a substantial house because that was something, for one thing you didn't borrow from banks. And so people had to be able to drive by and see your assets. Oh wow. See? And so people, that's one reason people put so much money into over the top houses. Because it was a, a it was that the last resort. If you'd have to take that, then you'll have something for your money. And um, this is Machupta Maidu mm -hmm. land. So, what percentage of his workers were Machupta Maidu? Oh, a very large percentage until the 1860s. Uh, in the 1860s, he could not have made his farm work at all had he not had the Machuptas, and they were um, smart people and they learned uh, modern skills. Uh, the Valley Indians were very different from the Mountain Indians. And in my second book, California Standoff, um, I discovered that in reading the anthropology of the period and combining it with historical information. Um, we all call, we call them all Maidus today. But they didn't see themselves as one people at all. There were the mountain Maidu and the plains. And the valley the Maidu, valley. yeah. And then within those, there were little, what we call ranch, what came to be called ran rancherias, little tribes. 
And even today, if you talk to local Indians, you will often say that they're a Berry Creek, or they're a Machupta, or they're a Kankau. That, they don't say, I'm my dude, because they still carry that ancient identity of the smaller group. How involved was Bidwell in the 1863 Round Valley March, where 435 Mardu were marched to across the valley and half of them died? What, what well, was his part in that? Well, he had a very large part in uh, that because he was having awful problems with the local farmers in the foothills. Um, children there had been killed by Indians, and one of the, the children, the three of a family, one of them had been kidnapped. So she had just disappeared. No, two of them disappeared. One had been killed. And so the farmers were just going crazy. So they came into town, and they believed that Bidwell Indians were involved. Not that they did everything, but it was known that Valley Indians sometimes crossed over and like young men who just, you know, something was wrong, they were just going to go out and help. Um, so there were occasionally beautiful Indians who were part of these parties. Well, these, got, these farmers got so angry, they came into town and they said, and they, they declared that if they didn't, um, if Bidwell didn't send his Indians away, that they would attack and drive them off with guns. And this was difficult for Bidwell for another reason. He not only had the Machubtas on his ranch, but he had, I think, four to six hundred Mountain Maidu who had been uh, put on the coastal reservation uh, several years earlier. They were being held here by, in a federal camp separate from his. Oh. While the government promised Bidwell he would find them, they would find a new reservation where these people could go back to the reservation. So the farmers, you see, saw those Indians all come, had come in and they felt overwhelmed and their children now were being killed. And so they threatened Bidwell. Well, actually, uh, before this, Bidwell has been pressing the Indian agent to get them off of his ranch, that he had done the guy a big favor by letting him have them wait here. But uh, he, he told uh, the Indian agent, I've done enough, take them away. He said, I don't have any place to put them, but as soon as I do, I will. But I don't right now. So Bidwell wrote the Secretary of the Interior in Washington, and he said that it's imperative to get these Indians off my ranch. They're creating nothing but trouble being here, and now they're dying uh, uh, every day. Uh, we're having, they're sick, they're very sick. Like smallpox and those kind of... It was, what it was is that malaria had set in a particularly, the most mortal type of malaria, according to my discussion with doctors about this, had come in and they were hovering over the creek. And Indians don't wear a lot of clothing, or didn't wear a lot of clothing then. And they didn't have a covered place to go uh, sleep. So they were always out with these mosquitoes around. And so Bidwell de demanded that they be sent away. So he was actually the first uh, force to get them removed. And you can see he had reasons, but it is, a, it is correct that he did. And so in talking about Round Valley, nobody has totally understood Round Valley until I did that research in standoff. There are so many things that I had unraveled in there. Um, one of them was that it's always been thought that 32 Indians died. And I found that that was the number who died between Chico 
and the base of the coastal ranges. Now it's just crossing. The Yoli Boli, is that that mountain range? I don't know the name of the mountain range, just across the valley. Right. Um, the, where, the mount, where the road continues up. Um, in any case, that was only 32 Indians. I found on the basis of people who were present, written the same days, that it was um, close to 200 Indians who died. Right. And so that was something that was always obscured. Now how did that get obscured, I found out. When the, the soldiers were talked about as enemies and they had been so terrible, the soldiers actually, some of them had malaria too, you know, and they did the best they could, but they had no, for example, many of the soldiers gave up their horses to put women on who were sick. Um, and uh, when they got to the base camp, uh, there was a mountain hotel there. Uh, they decided to leave the sickest Indians there so they could be tended to and take those that were still healthy on up and then they could inform the reservation and the reservation could take charge of them because they were supposed to be just transported. And, um, but they no sooner got away from the hotel than they began dropping and there were dead Indians all the way up. And this was mostly malaria. It was malaria. Um, and as they were dropping, other things happened. I mean, there were animals around and some terrible things happened. At the top of the mountain, there was nobody running the reservation. Oh, gosh. Because he knew they were coming and he had no food for them. He had to go to San Francisco to get the food and he got there that he had just been made the new head of the reservation and his papers hadn't gone through. So they wouldn't allow him to take food until his papers went through. Meanwhile, all these people are brought up here. And, the, and Captain Starr is in charge of this. So there is a military group up there and he confers with them and leaves them in charge. Well, they don't want to deal with this because this is all going to look like the military's you know, hmm. doings. Um, but it was left that way. But the lieutenant up there wrote a letter to his superior officer explaining all of this. All right, so then the military goes back down. They find that the Indians in the camp at the hotel area, who had been left with the federal agent, um, who had been in charge of them here, just one man, previously pre um, trained as a barkeeper. <laughs> and he turned out to be like an angel. Oh. He kept all of those people alive. Oh. And so anyway, the, the military came back to Chico where there was a camp. And I ventured, and I think I made a good case, that it was the colonel here reporting to headquarters what had happened. He said there were only 32 that died. And that has believed, been believed by everybody in the whole time I've lived in Chico until I found this out. Um, so, I mean, there are just discoveries all the time to make about this. I had a, a student named Thelma Wilson who said mm -hmm. that um, Bidwell was her grandfather and that he had Indian wives before he married Annie Bidwell. And what, um, what's your finding on that? Well, I wouldn't, I don't have any grounds to reject it. I mean, um, I don't think he had much of a, I mean, it's a of sex drive, frankly. I mean, he wasn't known for somebody interested in women hmm. in any, in any really active way. I'm not saying he was just close to the idea, um, because I don't think he was some people, but he was just so invested in these huge projects. 
I mean, this guy was doing like 50 things every day because I used to kind of watch his schedule. I mean, he was all, I don't know how I could do anything because everything was hanging on him. So I just don't think he had a lot left over. Time. <laughs> and there weren't a lot of candidates. There weren't many women around. So it's, perf it's perfectly conceivable. And um, it doesn't fit him in other things I know about him. But who knows about that part of people's right. lives? You yeah, know, that's so absolutely. Um, then Hutchinson said the next big event in Chico's Most Five was a railroad in 1870. Yeah, definitely. People had so much hope for the railroad. And it was a great day because the war had ended. The Chico's very split. This is another thing about the Civil War. He didn't mention that. But the Civil War was... It was like a little civil war here, wasn't uh -huh. it? A few people were shot at bars, but it was there was a very lot of uh, hard feeling. Were there any slave owners? Um, yeah, there was. Um, two families had brought a slave from the east, and I don't know if they were formally freed, but eventually they were. But those were young slaves, and they lived with them for a while. And in fact, uh, uh, a descendant of one of them, uh, a woman came from San Francisco to look up her family. And she was from one of those families. And this was a black woman. Um, it was, um, she, she was a descendant of, oh, it, it was a different family, a neighboring family of a local doctor uh, and the woman who had been a slave. And this woman was absolutely lovely. She was just elegant and just very sweet. And so it was wonderful to help her put together her background to this physician. So was it her grandmother who was a slave? It would. It probably would have been her great-grandmother. Great-grandmother. Uh, ah. um, in any case, there was a little bit of that, but there was a lot of hard feeling between Southerners and Northerners here. Hmm. What, what about the normal school, Chico? What's now Chico State, mm -hmm. 1887? How did that come about? Well, um, I can't recall exactly, but there was one public college uh, for teaching. This was regarded as a compelling need in itself. So it wasn't like at Berkeley was more Tony and more academic, scientific, which is grown up. The other was like a, a state college. It used to be, it was directed at teachers. And as they built that system, the state decided that people who lived in cities and, co and in the country were different. They need a different kind of education. Hmm. And so they needed a school that would focus on rural education. And so they decided to put that up here because San Jose State was more in the middle of urban life. Something like that was part of the uh, discussion hmm. or debate or assumptions. And um, so, you know, then the debate became would it be? Red Bluff or Chico. And so there was just a bitter struggle over that. Um, but of course there was total unity in each town behind it, and it's hard to say exactly what brought that about, the choice of Chico. Was Bidwell influential, do you think? Oh, I think so, because he made a huge donation of land. <laughs> My Where our speaks. offices used to be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We, we taught on that land. And that's where the Machupta used to camp, along yeah. the creek there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Bidwell could hear them, the children in the creek, splashing and laughing and running around. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and then that makes Chico, don't you think? I mean, without oh, yeah. Chico State, we would be Orville or Red, Red Bluff. Or... Absolutely. Uh, I remember that... Um, a very, what's her name, Dorothy Hill told me 
She said, we're, we are so fortunate we have the college. She said, if we didn't have the college, this would like, be like bigs. <laughs> I mean, that's small and limited. Biggs is a fine place, but um, it, does, it can't offer so much as we have here. And then uh, Hutchinson picked as his next key uh, historic event, the Diamond Match Company in 1900. I don't know anything about that. That was very big. The reason was that uh, Chico was a small, you know, it was a small town. It relied on farming and it longed for industry. And there's nothing ever that came up that was industrial because it needed to employ ordinary people of limited means and limited education. And when Diamond Match came here, then the whole town bloomed hmm. because there were lots of people coming in. There was a lot of housing being built, not very well built. Hence, the part that's called Chapman Town, the Chapman had nothing to do with across Mulberry. Um, that, I mean, those were people who didn't have much money. They just had to get started to do the best they could. And so that was a range of work. And uh, nobody paid any attention to it because there was no policing over there. Hmm. And um, by that time, Chapman had died. So he knew nothing about it. Wait, did they in fact make matches? Yes, they did. That did they make other the things? Country. I don't know. I don't know what, what they made. It, is the remnants of the factory still around? They're, one by one they burned down. I think there may be one or two buildings out there still. It's a lovely area now. And I am unsure why it hasn't been developed. For so housing. it's um, in the Barber neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, and then he picked the Chico Army Air Base, and you said that was in the 40s. Yes. And that, that led to the Chico Airport. Yes. And soldiers used to, well, it was a huge boon to the town. All these soldiers came in. It was great for girls. <laughs> you know, they were great to men, they had great parties. From the normal school. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, they used to come, soldiers would come here and sing on the porch, somebody told me. You know, just um, like serenade the yeah, young talk, women? Just, well, in those days, people sang. You know, no, we don't sing anymore. Um, but they like to get together and do that. So, um, yes, it made, a big, it made a big impact. A lot of descendants are still here oh. from those soldiers. Oh. So, yeah. So, yes, I think that was very important. Why, why did they close down that airport as a footnote? Why, why can't we fly uh, out of Chico? Well, you know, I do not know. I do not know how Reading can always come up with this stuff, but we don't. I think, though, I have an impression from some sources that Reading subsidizes it, and we refuse to. Uh. I mean, one of the problems of Chico State being here is that for all so long, Chico State has provided resources that the state never had to provide and that local taxpayers never had to provide. Entertainment comes here, by, brought by the university. Cultural it has, events. has for years. Yeah, and uh, we, they had auditoriums at the university. They could stage things, and everybody was happy to have them do that at the university. And so, and in construction, a lot of construction at the university. So we kind of, our predecessors here, people in control, which you and I never were, um, they're, um, their generosity with state money and sharing it with the town was well placed. But it made the town not feel empowered or equipped or its vision mm. wasn't as something mm. that it should be taken mm. care of. Do you think that's changed or not? Well, it can't, I keep hearing that it's going to. Oh. But it doesn't, I don't see any difference actually. I mean, there have been talks of having big um, 
uh, like recreation centers for the town or um, more sports facilities. So Especially for the youth. Yeah. Yeah. There should be a really nice public swimming place, something that's attractive and clean and that everyone can go to. And uh, we were fortunate to have the creek uh, pool, but it's a big One town mile. now. Yeah. It's a large, Chico's a fairly large town now. And people are afraid to swim there and get ear infections Yeah, and stuff. that's right. Um, then I would add that to Hutchinson's list that in 1905, Annie Bidwell donated 1,900 mm -hmm. acres of Bidwell Park. That, that's that the other huge. thing that makes Chico. That was huge. I think it's so amusing that she was a woman's Christian temperance oh, person, yeah. so no alcohol yeah, in the park. True. <laughs> and violated all the time, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, she was, she was quite a character. I mean, she's an. I should identify with her because, you know, I mean, we. She's an. She was an educated woman and had high ideals and. And she um, acted as a lay minister for the Presbyterian Church. Yeah. I mean, there was much to be said for that. But she also had the limitations of her time, as well. But this thing about temperance, there was a lot to be said about it because alcohol was just everywhere. And women suffered so much because of husbands who drank their money away and beat their wives. And there was no protection for wives. However, what they were treated was a private matter. And so Mrs. Bidwell, she'd understood these things because her brother was an alcoholic. Ah. And he was always somebody they had to, you know, save, help him, try to understand him, try to ignore ways he had offended themselves, other people, undermine their families, reputation, at least in their own minds, feeling vulnerable to that. So you can see where that comes from. and then. And Bering Bidwell, well, that was a shock because, you know, he had a winery and um, he was certainly not an, uh, a temperance person. But he was fed up because employees he had so much trouble with, he must have. Um, and so, you know, happy wife, happy life. He figured that out early. And he wasn't totally uncomfortable with it because he knew. In fact, <laughs> um, we, years and years ago, I had the outhouse dug up here. And um, it was brick lined, and it was fascinating. It was full of liquor bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman here was in the, in the WDCU, Women's Christian, you know, Christian Temperance Union. Yeah, WCD. Um, so that's what he was doing. <laughs> oh, he hid his bottles in the outhouse. <laughs> well, he got rid of them He'd, where they wouldn't be found. <laughs> oh. So anyway. My, my grandmother, no, my great-grandmother was a women's Christian temperance union, and she would march into restaurants and say, do you serve liquor? Yes, ma'am. And they, she would march out. <laughs> and oh, and her husband cute. would take people to the secret stash in the basement where he had wine. Is that right? <laughs> He was, well, that's a riot. Yeah. I know. <laughs> My grandmother was, too. Yeah. Um, she. I read that she was 39 when she married him, Bidwell. Why would I she... I think she was like 29, 28 or 29. And it was, you know, she was on, she was on the very verge of being a single woman. Spinster. A spinster. And, boy, the women didn't want that. Um... If you were a spinster, that meant you were basically going to be a servant in a brother's house or a sister's house. You were going to be carried by the family. And that meant you had, for the rest of your life, to deal with them and meet their standards and sort of always being seen as the failure. So she was really, she was right on the verge of that. and. Um, she also, I mean, she was a typical young woman looking at her early letters. 
she was when she was a young woman with her sister, they were interested in rich young men. <laughs> so they got that early. They got that figured out early. Well, it makes sense if you're dependent on exactly. someone, you might as well have someone who can provide for your children and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, her father was a very distinguished public servant, but it, there's nothing to say that he was really wealthy and certainly not much to pass on to three or four children. So I can understand that he was looking all the better. I'm not saying she didn't have feelings for him. She must have. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to marry somebody you're going to find repulsive. But, um, and he certainly carried himself well and was confident and clearly someone who was trusted. And, and if she had this kind of do-gooder personality, it might have appealed to her to come and minister to the heathen kind yeah, of a thing. Well, she got here. It was something for her to tap. It was a part she could take. And, of course, true to her day, the only true moral standards were her, were her churches. And she, thought that, she thought that the Methodists were just too loose. <laughs> <laughs> and it made her nervous when they were around. <laughs> did they dance? Did well, Presbyterians didn't not dance, right? <laughs> Methodists didn't dance. Oh. I don't know about Presbyterians. I think they did. Yeah, the Baptists. Yeah, so did. I don't get it myself. <laughs> but so maybe they drank. Maybe the, maybe so. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. So. I don't know. I don't know whether they did or not. Some didn't. The Chapmans never did. I mean, they always drank. They had friends who were temperance. Their son turned temperance. But they, you know, he became a merchant. Uh, Chapman was, his start here was as the manager for Bidwell's store. And then he and Bidwell's partner in that store moved over and started their own separate store. What was it called? Wood and Chapman. It was at 3rd and Main where the ice cream shop used to be in our time, um, northwest corner. And so um, they always sold alcohol as a wholesale thing to the bars. And, um, and he liked Porter, <laughs> Chaplin too. So uh, I think, and they worked, you know, in those days. They worked 10, 10 12 hours a day. So when he got home, I think he wanted his brother, <laughs> you know, after that. And it was so hard to travel. Everything, everywhere he wanted to go was hours away. So you, you got interested in Chapman because you bought the house that he built. Yeah. So I read that it was a farmhouse built in 1859 and 53, then 53. And then, well, it was started in 53 by a judge or admirable guy, but I think he had malaria or something. Anyway, he died after putting up the piers. And then the piers could be seen from the road. The, the foundation, the foundation. pieces. Mm. And so when his estate closed, it went to a local doctor, J.B. Smith, and he built these two buildings, two-story. And there was there were stairs there to the second floor, and when I recarpeted it last, you can see where it was filled in. And upstairs they slept. He had hired hands. He wasn't married here. He was a physician and veterinarian. Wow. He did both for Bidwell and others. Um, and so my thinking is, this would have been a sort of a general sitting room. That would have been a kitchen, maybe also his uh, office. Um, so that was fun reconstructing him, because I found other evidence for him when he, the, the, vet, the physician, when he was in the gold fields, and then came down here. And uh, when Chapman bought it, well, it had been lost in a, um, uh, uh, it was lost 
in a collapse of the economy in the 1860s. The so physician he lost, mm -hmm. he, he couldn't pay the mortgage or whatever. Right. Okay. So anyway, so a couple more owners and then Chapman acquired a thousand acres. Wow. When, then, when was that? That was in 1869. Wow. So, and then he remodeled this house. Then, yeah, he couldn't, he spent all that money, so I think he couldn't afford really to tear it down. But on his map, there's a little squiggle, and it's sort of the shape of the Bidwell house across the street. And uh, so that was his dream place. And so in 1877, he sold this place to the guy who ran the M&T Ranch. And then who wanted to bring his children to town to school. And he built a big, beautiful house facing that street, facing East 11. So that was Chapman Street. This was Nelson for that, the family that bought this house. And um, that house uh, was a 14-room house, very long. and. Um, it, they built it close to the sidewalk, and I can understand why. This house is back from the sidewalk. Everybody gets soaked trying to get in this house because you can't get close to it. You have to, you know, go all. So they put theirs like Eastern style, you know, right up very close to the street. And they lived in that house until they had to sell it. Um, what happened in Chapman's case is that he was very poor as a young man. And he was dedicated to rising in the world. It was like an obsession. And he gradually became, well, he started here. He became a lawyer and a merchant in Michigan. Came here, started out as a, a man, a chief clerk in Biddle's store, had his own store. Then acquired a large mill in the mountains and became a major lumberman with sales in, through Northern California, as far as Salt Lake City. And then began buying other real estate here and there. And then he got into huge problems with Bidwell, which I can't go into here, but I, do, I, did, um, fi I did figure out. Did you write book. about it in one of your, what book? Well, the one I'm finishing now. And what, what will be the title? Chico's Chapman. So it has a lot of Chico history about the development of the town. So it's not just about Chapman. A couple of people who've read it said I should have written one about Chico and another about Chapman. But that's how I found Chapman, through the development of Chico, because he was so involved in it. And um, so eventually he, 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 was so, he went through such drills to Follow this obsession for uh, being wealthy, that it just exhausted him, and he decided he wanted to go to public service at some high level. Hmm. Well, he, he had become, in fact, um, a uh, merchant who had helped him establish the store Wood and Chapman, was George Perkins of Oroville, who owned a large uh, uh, store there and had left to go to the state government and from there to be head, head of a sailing freighting business. And they both got back together. Perkins decided to run for governor and he invited Chapman to be part of his administration. And Chapman agreed, but it was an enormous responsibility because at that time, state government was fairly small. When is this, roughly? This was in 1879. And at this time, then, one of the things that state government did on a large scale was it had to take care of prisons for the state. So the appointments to the prison commission were very savored political appointments. And he appointed Chapman to that, his, and made him chairman of it at a time when Folsom was being completed and San Quentin was just packed and almost impossible to manage. 
And so Chapman went in there and they did amazing things. They created uh, services for prisoners who died, cemeteries they hadn't had. They um, stopped the beating of prisoners. They um, demanded that food in the prisons be at, like a boarding house level. And Perkins was determined to make the prison self-supporting hmm. so the politicians could stay away from them. And they decided to do that, and this is Chapman and him, Chapman and he, uh, decided to have the prisons make grain bags. All wheat, the, the only wheat, only prop, the only product up here was wheat. And we couldn't sell wheat eats to here because the Midwest covered the nation. So our wheat had to go on the international market. Mm. Ships wouldn't carry wheat if it was just free in the bins because it would shift. Shift, yeah. <clears throat> so it all had to be bagged, which meant millions of bags. <laughs> and farmers had to buy these bags. And I think Chapman might have been the source of this idea because he used to, in the stores, sell these bags and he knew about the feeling about them. So anyway, what Chapman did that was so remarkable is in two years he had acquired all the equipment and supervisors from Scotland. They were shipped over and in place, outworked, and on the second year Chapman was head of the prisons. They were making a profit. Wow. So it was a remarkable service. And he was just about to go out. He did go out. He made a national tour of prisons to compare their experience and what products prisoners can make well. And um, so he came back with some good ideas about that. But by that time, the, another election had taken place, and Perkins had lost. Hmm. So all kinds of political things went on after that. So Chapman had to leave that. So he came back here, and he felt very defeated by all that. And so he tried to, he was responsible for building the building where Lee Pharmacy used to be, where uh, the, the coffee place is today. Um, that everybody goes to have coffee. Oh, um. Starbucks. Starbucks. Sorry. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, so I'm never Yeah, me either. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, he built that building, and it was very beautiful. It hadn't been all stripped. And then he also was responsible for building the road up to Miguelia hmm. through the canyon. And after that, he just went bankrupt. Really? Gradually. He, just, he kept trying again and again. And everybody had so much confidence, they would keep giving him loans. And he was totally honest. If he couldn't make his payments, he would sell something. So he was always honorable about his failure. Um, but in the end, the last thing he had was that house. And that had to go. And when he died in 1899, he and his wife had a little tiny mill up in the mountains, the last sort of a garbage mill, but that was a little cottage up there and you didn't ever live there in the winters. You had to, everyone came down in the winters. So they actually lived in the winters in the guest room of friends. Wow. So it was rags to riches to rags in one generation. And how many children did he have? <clears throat> he had, he had five, five children and there's one direct descendant out of all of those children. Huh. None of them had children or their children didn't have children. Oh my goodness. Except for one. And so it's kind of a strange story. I couldn't find anybody that was related to them. I searched and searched. But finally, when I came back to this after publish the, publishing the book on Indian settler problems, I decided if I don't if I don't finish that Chapman book, it's just going to be files that are going to be dumped. So I have to do that. Last thing I do, I have to get that book done. 
And um, so that's where my attention is gone. <laughs> so that, do you know where that Chapman descendant is? Oh, is yes. By going to, I'm sorry, that's where I was going. Um, through Ancestry.com and Google. I just kept going back and forth through names that I did think I could maybe. It was very difficult. But I found this woman who's 92 mm. and very smart. And she's in uh, near Modesto. And her name is Janet Goodnow. Um, and she knew the name in her family, but she knew nothing about them. So she's been just delightful. But now I'm thinking, I'm, I'm feeling so happy, you know, to find this connection. Because, you know, it's really a nice thing to be able to give somebody. But, you know, he was, he was a flawed person. And I don't, I hope she doesn't take offense that I give the whole textured story. But that's one of my flaws as a writer. I try to get the whole picture. That's not a flaw, that's a virtue. <laughs> well, so I think so. Chapman, the family lived in the house where you are now, and they sold it because he ran out of money? He had to well, sell this it? house uh, was sold in 76. So he didn't actually live here very long uh -huh. because he built the big house. And he lived in that house from 77 to 91. Oh. So, and then that's when he had to start living in the mountains and in, at friends' houses. Um, you, you mentioned that um, history um, in Chico is mythology a lot of it. You mentioned some of it, like the number of Machupta who died on the, yeah. the Round Valley March. I, I majored in history in college, and they really emphasize that history is subjective, and you can't take it at face value, and you have to look at the context. What, what are other examples that you've learned that our mythology about Chico isn't factual? Well, one of the things is just, uh, there's a People did a lot of oral interviews about 20 years ago. And you'd think that would be a great source. But it's really curious because so many people don't really have much to say, of, or that maybe they're asked the wrong questions. I think that's part of it. But this one, I remember this man um, who was very elderly in, the, in 1970. He said, he said, well, we were just a happy kind of family town. Well, that's not true. And uh, the Chinese thing, some very elderly people were very put off by that and offended by it. Um, that you wrote about it? Well, not that I did, but that somebody was making all these claims about, you know, that it wasn't just radicals coming in, that it was ingrained into the town that kind of thing. And then, um, not long ago, I was at the Bidwell Museum giving a talk, and a young man came up to me and he said, I, he said, I um, introduced himself, I don't remember his name, it doesn't matter. He said, well, you, he said, so you're the writer who's written all these bad things about my town. <laughs> and I was kind of shocked, so I don't even remember what I, how I respond to But you know, you, don't you think every town is like that because we're human beings? Absolutely. I wrote about a farm wife killed by her Chinese servant that flew through everything in Duflory because women kept hiring Chinese when their husbands were trying to drive out Chinese. So there was this big problem in town. A gender problem. And when this Chinese servant killed the housewife, this was that perfect from the part of the Anna Chinese to get women finally to their side. And um, in, in doing that, in that episode, when it was, um, when he was finally found, he, he wouldn't talk, he wouldn't say anything. But a um, Chinese, oh, an agent for the Chinese six companies, a lawyer, a, a white man, a lawyer, 
came to see him in jail. And he said, he talked to the white man. And what happened was the, um, the Chinese boy had worked for the wife in the house. And he had gone out t at two different times when he found her, the housewife, with the chief hired hand <laughs> being affectionate in some way or other. And after the second time, the hired hand came, sought him out, and said, if you don't shut up or get out of here, I'll kill you. And so he, when they were all at the table, the husband was away in San Francisco. Um, the wife was there with two, top, two children and the hired man. So he whips his rifle through the kitchen door and shoots the hired hand, except that um, I think he hit the man or didn't, and he shot again. But in shooting again, it, it, it murdered the wife. And he actually he loved the wife because she was his teacher and she took care of him. So he felt horrible that, that he had done that. When was this? And then he fled. Oh. So this was in 1886, uh, just across the river. So um, I had a call from a family member. He said, I'm sitting at the table where this happened. How do you know about this? What do you know about this? And I said, well, I said, if you, I said, it was, oh, there's an article in News Review. I said, well, I have all the um, sources in the footnotes. I said, if you'd like to see that, just go to the library at Chico State. And before it went out, all I know of, uh, Dorothy Hill asked me if I couldn't eliminate their name from it. Uh, just do it, but, you know, not give the name. And so I called California History, and I said, is that possible? He said, no, this is history. It has to be there. He was kind of shocked that I would even ask. But I was still sort of new at this game. And so there was <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, wanting to paint over what and who. And so it's always a temptation. And frankly, it has freed me. I'm not socially very active at all. I have a few friends, but I'm not in any swim, you know. And so during all the time I've been doing this, I didn't know people. Because since then, I have met people and I've thought, ooh, <laughs> you know. Because the, the Lem family who owned the farm where the Chinese were killed, their level of theory of me is just endless but they couldn't do anything about it, and I felt bad for them, but it's what happened. Right. And so I just think, and the children of that generation, though, the people here now have been very supportive mm. and very interested. And in fact, one of them said that his father, who had been a leader of those people, he said his father and, and them, and they had actually become to see that this is just interesting and it's not anything that destroys the town, it's just the world. Um, could you tell us your books in order again, the topics and what they're about and where people can get them? Oh, well thank you. Um, the first was Exploring Chico's Past, which has all the anti-Chinese articles. Um, it has articles on women in Chico. It has I think a rather uh, full account of blacks in Chico and some other things. Uh, the second is called Standoff, California Standoff, uh, which is the uh, settlement period of the wars between Indians and whites, each one. It was a war for territory. And both had the same, had similar values actually. Each was full of poor people. No one was here to protect either side. And they both needed territory to survive. Both of those books are at uh, Made in Chico. 
and the California standoff is there and at um, Bird in Hand. And they're both on Amazon.com. And then uh, California, uh, Chico's Chapman will be next. And I'm going to do that one in more limited co copies uh, because I just don't have the energy to go out and market anything very much. I want to get it into libraries. I actually think people would en will enjoy it because it's a biography, it's a narrative about a person, people, and they'll recognize a lot in it. And people have always said that I would, I'm the historian of diversity you know, because of all that. Well, I've established that, and this is all white. <laughs> <laughs> so people can go rather broad. <laughs> Is there another one that you're thinking about or researching? No. no, I want to be free of all that. I don't want any pressure anymore. I don't have the energy or the health, actually, to take anything substantial on. So my pleasure, beginning very soon, is to go back to genealogy, because I have been finding amazing things about my own family that I never knew, that my family never knew. So it's just. That's going to be at my pace. That's your history, family. your personal history. That's my family. What's, what's one example of something you found that was surprising about your family? Well, um, there are several. One is that they actually, two of them were on the Mayflower and they're very different. One was uh, named Billingham. He was a London laborer with his two sons. And his two sons got into big trouble on the ship because they had his pipe right near the barrels of gunpowder. And they got into very big trouble for that. And then on land, he wasn't part of the Puritan elite, but I think there was some kind of political problem, perhaps over land or something. But anyway, he killed this guy. And so my, that ancestor of mine was the first man known hanged. <laughs> That's one. And then the other on the ship was the, who was the pastor? The famous pastor. Isn't that funny? I can always remember the hanged man, but I can't remember the pastor. But he was actually the more, fa he was fairly famed. Um, and I like him because they have saved his life. I don't know if they saved the library, but they have a, a, collect, a written list of all his books. So I like to... <laughs> oh, books that he brought with him. Yeah, uh. so, so very different, you know, and that's history. <laughs> the, the man who was hanged, did he have time to have children? He had two children, oh. and one of his children, three generations down, married one of the pastor's children. So they were like distant cousins. They weren't ever... They weren't, those were not cousins on the uh, ship. Mm. They had nothing to do with uh, one uh. because total class difference. But three generations down, their children's children's children intermarried. History's great. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I do too. I mean, that kind of thing, and you just happen onto it. And on the East Coast, you know, they're so steeped in research on lines that, I mean, you can't really seek this. You just find it. Mm. It just shows up. And it, um, to kind of bring this all up to the present, sure. Chapman has kind of been neglected, I think you could say. Oh, you yeah. said it didn't have police services and it's kind of ramshackle. Has it changed? Or is it, what do you well, see? Well, finally now that part that isn't adding anything to do with him is now part of the city just recently. Um, this part uh, didn't have the level of crime and that kind of thing and it had nicer houses. It's just that it came into that period when any old house was considered it must be trash. You know? Mm. And so people weren't keeping it up. Another problem in, uh, is that um, in elderly couples they don't often have the energy to keep up or the income to hire help. And so often you can distinguish houses that are left because they just can't keep it up. So that's a sympathetic reason. 
why these things do happen. But um, it's been looking up, it's looking a lot better now. And very nice people have lived here. A person across the street from me gave a million dollars to the university. Wow. And the whole house over there is the size of two rooms oh my in goodness. my house. Oh my goodness. So you never know, you know, about oh. people. Oh no. Yeah. And then another um, neighbor down the street was uh, his family's in in Hollywood and was part of a big uh, production company in Hollywood. So, and then there's scattered faculty and a lot of working class people of all kinds, some public employees. You know, so it's, um, when Chapman built it, this was out in the country. Mm. And he had trouble selling because people didn't want to travel that far. Mm. And now it's not the travel that's the problem. It's the new developments that come up. And, but at the same time, the location is actually quite centered now because there's so much in South Chico. So people are start, have really been in recent years been putting more money into the houses here. And also there's a big vogue of having small houses now. Mm -hmm. So these are small houses, but they have yards. And so that has some appeal. So that makes me feel good because when I, I was here visiting with a neighbor and she said, why are you doing all that to that house to fix it up? He, she said, you'll never be able to sell it for, for what you put in it. I said, I'm not building, I'm not doing this for anybody else. I'm just doing it for myself. <laughs> do, you, do you have it set up so that it will be a historic building at some point or something well, like that? Well, it's on the National Trust now. And I'm uh, expecting that my stepdaughter will inherit it and come and live. She's a, a lawyer in, in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey right mm. now. But she's planning to retire in five years. Mm. This is Barney's daughter? Mm -hmm. mm. Elena. Mm. Oh, right. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, she's in her 50s. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've uh, been passed over now. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is the Chapman Mansion. And we're going to see the interior. So this would be the sitting room? This was the sitting room, always. And, and this was, uh, the fireplace was uh, backed by the wood stove on the other side oh. in the dining room. Would, would that be their main source of heat in the 1870s? It was. And they had no cooling in the hot mm -hmm. summers? And that's why um, you notice as you go that there are doors and windows opposing one another. I took oh. out a couple in this room, but they were very big on circulation and Look. having more than one door. Uh, votes for women. So that this is from the from the East Coast. Oh my goodness! Uh. And this would be like the study. This was the parlor. The parlor is yeah. this where you would have like your fancy guests, you know, formal. Yes. This is where you'd have a wedding or a funeral. Ah, and who are these people? Those are the Chapmans. Ah. What an interesting character. You need light? I think I'm good. Okay. And these are my diaries in back of me. From 1955, I've kept. That you are your person? <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> So do you write, today I read a book and I wrote this, or... Gail Kimball came by. Gail Kimball. Dangerous to come to my house. Uh -huh. And I learned the... Uh -huh. The whole story. And this is the formal dining room. Which was the original kitchen. Oh, this was the kitchen. Uh -huh. ah. And the wood stove was right. And what, what were the... Um, 
Was this like standard that you would paint decorations on the floor? This is what poor people did who couldn't afford carpet. Oh. They used stencils. And but this, was a, this wasn't this a wealthy family's home? No, this was a farm. It was a rent house. Right. You know, bachelor's rent house. Right. And um, the carpet I found was very old. Like you'd seen a bad motel. Uh. <laughs> and yeah. the wood under it is not good wood. And then, did you add this I part on? This. There was a kitchen that had built, built that stood out, but it was very unworkable for a moment. So, this, when was this added roughly? That was added in 99. Oh, this is. This wing going out. And then upstairs are obviously bedrooms. Yes. How many? Correct. There are three in the front, up above, and then mine is over the garage. Ah. And this is a guest bedroom? Yes, it is. Um, it was mine for a number of years. And every, these houses, if yeah, they could easily have one ground floor bedroom because it would be necessary. Ah. And look at this. This is like the an original toilet. Yes. 